Hello, and welcome to my, basically, a look back at the year 2023, a bit of a year in review of the gaming industry so far. Just looking back at some of the best, worst, and some of the biggest disappointments, really, that have come out of 20, uh, 2023. <coughs> of course, I'm aiming to get this, uh, and it, it will, with luck, be up ready for uh, the 1st of January, but of course, just on the run-up, I've managed to become sick as a dog, so apologies if there's any coughing and spluttering, I'll try and keep it to a minimum and uh, cut it out when I can, but it is it is what it is. Um, Looking back, we've had a lot of really interesting games come out this year, both great and awful, and some really interesting new ideas as well, coming from uh, the indie scene and so on. Kicking things off, though, with, because, again, I'm, I'm going to kind of, as, as the format here, I'm going to kind of have a bit of a look back at some of the interesting things that have happened. It's not going to be too long, just to save my voice, because, again, I've got a horrible cold and a cough at the moment, so it'll probably be shorter than I wanted this to be. But we're going to start off uh, with just looking at some of the absolute disasters that came out this year. So, on the subject of disasters, just, my god, the the Golem game. That's a thing that existed. I remember thinking that, like, when I, when I saw the original footage of this in, like, trailers and that, I was thinking, why, why do we need a Golem game? No one asked for a Golem game. <laughs> you know, what could it possibly even entail? It's, what, going to be, like, a stealth thing or something? And... No, it was an absolute unmitigated disaster full of bugs and bad design and bad story. It just seems to go from left to right and all kinds of nonsense happening with it. <laughs> but, yeah, the thankfully it's something that I looked at reviews of and managed to avoid. But, yeah, unfortunately some people did not and... The game was so bad that the publisher and developer, well, the de de uh, the developers behind it shut shop. They're still in the publishing game, but um, they won't be making games anytime soon. I think it's done, done that much reputational damage. They've just thrown in the towel on that. That's just how bad it was. This is then, of course, followed by the amazing uh, Kong, I think, like, Rise of Kong Skull Island or something along those lines, but the Kong game this year, just absolute terrible, terrible game. I've not seen much, I've only heard horrible things. I've actually looked into it a bit more uh, for this segment, and what I have seen is, I mean, it looks like a mobile game. It's just awful like why does this exist you know it, it it really does look like not even like a recent mobile game it looks like a mobile game from like years and years ago it's really bad looking so you know it, it as if golem wasn't bad enough kong comes along and goes hold my beer and we get this absolute trash this year of course though not to be outdone we then get the likes of The Walking Dead Destinies, which, my god, why does this exist? It's it's like just a jumble of really bad gameplay mechanics that just really, really do not work. And the whole, like, it's, it's like that it has all the things you would want. But yeah, it kind of has like all the things you would want from this kind of game, where it's got, okay, you can change the actual outcome of, like, change the story from what happens in the show. Um, <laughs> and it looks like it tries to, you know, there's like a full-on health system and your guy gets panicked and all this stuff. Like, there's loads of different mechanics, which I can only imagine if they were actually working... I think to myself, well, what would this game be like if it were working? And it's like, well, essentially all these mechanics but working adds up to basically something like The Last of Us. Like, 
if this were done correctly, you could have had something the likes of that that's Walking Dead themed, allows you to change what happens from the show and that. But no, you get this absolute dumpster fire because none of the mechanics function properly. Or if they do, they're very basic and just terrible. <laughs> the animations are bad. The the cutscenes are barely what you would classify as cutscenes. And it's literally just a case of um, your guy... Um, what's it? It's just like... Almost like still frames, like it were made in PowerPoint. You know? It's got all the kind of features, and again, you've got like these execution moves, you've got all this sort of stuff, but it's it's just abysmally put together. But of course, this isn't the worst game of the year, and again, if you want to find more of these, you know, by all means, just slam them into uh, YouTube. You can find some hilarious footage and reviews of these. Thankfully, I stayed away from absolutely every single one of them, but so I've you know been getting the footage here from like various reviewers and things that have uh, looked at the game but there's been an absolute shit show this year for like worst game of the year there really should be a like a mock series of pr uh, awards and things just for bad games there really needs to be but of course there can be only one winner and just, and what, what we're looking at here is like the last trailer they brought out for this before release, which, I mean, e even this looks better than what got actually released. It was just that bad. And it it looks, it just looks so bad, the game, especially the, the full release version. It's, I, I would highly recommend YouTube, day before, trailer versus uh, release version. You can get these side-by-side -side comparisons. They're brilliant. It's it's a good 15 minutes of fun if you, if you fancy doing it. But I think this definitely gets worst game of the year. Not just because of the... Like, the other games were bad. But you'd see the trailers and you'd look at the gameplay for more than five seconds. And you kind of knew they were going to be bad. And no one were hyped for those. This was enormously hyped up. The gameplay they'd shown was actually amazing looking. God knows where it went. And then what they've released is an absolute dumpster fire mess. Lots of things have been coming out about this as to why it's ended up as it has. And I've got my own theories. I, I think genuinely what's happened. It seems to be, because everyone's saying it must have been a scam, but... From the looks of things, they're not going to make any money off of this. It looks like it really is just a screwed up project. It, it looks less of a scam and more just complete and utter incompetence. And just looking at it myself, it, it looks to be what seems to have happened. I can't say for sure, of course, but what seems to have happened is they've... A uh, little indie company have gone and bought... A bunch of assets from the store, from the Unreal store, thought to themselves, well, if we just stitch these into a game, you know, if, if we just stitch these together, it'll make an excellent zombie game. And figured that that's all they need to do to make a game. Which, they're not entirely wrong, but, you know, you do have to actually stitch them together successfully and know what you're doing. And you really have to know what you're doing with those, because, you know, there can be no worse sometimes than diving into a stranger's code and trying to figure it, like, reverse engineer and figure it out. So they'll have probably just been, like, rummaging around through the, you know, dozens and dozens of assets they bought, trying to cobble something together unsuccessfully. Until eventually... I mean, I remember when the first delays came through and we were hearing about loads of people leaving the studio and them looking for people to help volunteer and things to do uh, translations and stuff. I was thinking, okay, something's off here. I reckon that was, you know, rats fleeing the sinking ship, realising what was happening, knowing that if right now they go to a new company, they can put the day before on their resume, and it seemed impressive. 
Whereas if they wait until the release day, that won't happen. So I reckon that's what was going on. And then it released and we got what we got, which was... I think all that gameplay was... Because there's been a lot of accusations about it being just an asset flip. And it very much looks like it is. So I reckon a lot of this footage is just them setting up all the assets they've bought and getting them to work in like a small control environment getting this to work on a server and to run smoothly is a much much harder task which is probably why we got so little when we did again thankfully this is i when i smell something fishy these days with games I tend to immediately avoid them. I just tend to go, ah, something seems off. And I'll just wait for reviews. And I'm so glad I did with this. Because this looks absolutely up my alley. I remember playing the Division survival mode back in the day with my brother. It was absolutely brilliant. But And this looks like that, but with zombies. It looks like it could be really good. But thank God I didn't pre-order uh, pre anything. Because... <laughs> It looks like an absolute goddamn mess. It really does. But, I think the thing that really, though, sets it as the worst game of the year again, it's not just that it was as bad as it, you know, it was as bad as it was, it's that it then, the studio that made this, and pretty much, what were it, win four days, uh, they shut down the entire studio, and the servers are going to go offline sometime uh, next year, I think. So the servers won't even be up for long. And there will be no updates. There will be no attempt to fix this. Um, the the worst bit is, is the, this, isn't, this is just like the highlights of the worst. Like we've had some terrible ga games this year. And some really scummy things done with like... Uh, battle passes and microtransactions we all remember that this is the year that uh, what's it uh, blizzard just decided to say hey you know that whole campaign thing we were going to do with overwatch 2 the entire reason for its existence and why we needed to be release it with a 2 on the end rather than just doing a graphics update and wiping everyone's progress you know, you know the whole reason for being of that game? Yeah, we're just going to not do that. There's been a bunch of nasty things happen this year. But I think the thing that, again, makes this the worst is not just that it was massively pre-ordered, the scale of it, it's, it's that it happened right before Christmas. And honestly, I think if it weren't for the Steam refund system, this almost could have been like a real... You know, this studio could have ended up basically being the Grinch just before Christmas. They really could have been. And I've just screwed everyone over uh, over for Christmas. That's, they almost did that. Thankfully, these days, we have a lot better media coverage of things. I'm very grateful that we've got all the YouTube reviewers and stuff like that about now. Because we got early warnings about this well in advance that it was you know, something was off. Don't pre-order it, and thank God most people didn't. Right. Of course, again, there's been some other stuff this year happening. We'll be moving swiftly on. And, of course, we get the real, the real loser of the year. And this isn't just about Starfield. Like, kind of going off on a... Uh, uh, on, on kind of the same footing as what we were just on about there with worst game of the year. Remember that Redfall happened this year. That was an absolute mess. But also Starfield. And so for this category, it's going to be the most disappointing thing to happen in 2023. And it doesn't go to just um, a game, this one. I'm, I'm giving it as a publisher-wide uh, well, an, an entire company-wide reward, this. Bethesda are my nomination. Yeah, They receive the reward for biggest disappointment of 2023, which is not looking good, given that it wasn't all that long since Fallout 76 was a thing. And, yeah, that was an absolute clusterfuck of a mess. 
I think I've never seen something fail so badly since Fallout to 76 until we got to like Gollum this year it, it, it was that bad but Redfall was a game that nobody wanted the developers making it didn't want to make it the Pete the suits behind the entire uh, the the entire thing were just desperate for battle passes and microtransactions and we're just trying to shoehorn all of that in to an obviously unenthusiastic set of developers that didn't really want to be making what they were making. So we've got an absolute mess in Redfall. The thing is, I've seen Arcane Studios at their best, which I've I've seen I've not played many of their games. I've played only one. I've played Prey. Prey is one of my favourite horror games. Um. <clears throat> But it's um, and while while it were brilliant, I think there were definitely things you could change, things you could tweak. It could certainly be a bit more atmospheric and darker throughout the game. There's a lot of light in there, but and I absolutely loved though the uh, uh, what's it, the moon DLC as well, the roguelike mode. Absolutely fantastic idea. But um, the thing with uh, with prey and with uh, we start. Well, so the thing with uh, Arcane is that I know they can do that, and then I see them making Redfall. It's an absolute disaster. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that said, this year was also the year of Starfield. Starfield isn't a bad game. I think it's a Straight up 7 out of 10. Um, it really is a 7 out of 10 game. Nothing overly wrong with it. But yeah, there's there's nothing crazily wrong with it. And I genuinely would say it's a 7 out of 10 game. And it's a shame that it's got... I mean, it's just, uh, it's just gone over to... Uh, Mostly, uh, mostly negative reviews on Steam. And I think it highlights a problem I have with the review system on Steam. You either recommend it or you don't. So a game could just be kind of bad, but not awful. And it will get mostly negative reviews. Because people just wouldn't recommend it to, uh, to other pl uh, players. You know, a game I don't recommend doesn't mean it's bad doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it might be mediocre. <laughs> Starfield is one of those games. The, the problem is, is that there was an enormous amount of hype around this. Probably the most hype around anything this year other than the day before. And genuinely, you know, everyone's really looking forward to what they're going to get from Bethesda and their newest, you know, the new IP, first new IP, you know, over 20 years or whatever. And... When I say it's a completely mediocre game, I really do mean that. Like, every mechanic in this game either does the job or misses the mark. It's not necessarily bad. You know, I don't think there's any part of it that I'd say, this is just awful. But I would say, this could be better. Or, it gets the job done, I guess. Like, the shooting mechanics get the job done. Fallout did it better because it had dismemberment. It had, um, yeah, it had dismemberment. It had this whole, um, what's it, uh, uh, the VATS targeting. That was brilliant. That really helped with it. Um, but the game was just, it, it just, like, lacked anything fantastic. Like, Fallout you could play, and it's like, yeah, it had some really good story moments. This doesn't have as many. There's like one or two in there. The mission where you're kind of darting between those two different dimensions in that science base is a really good mission. You know, um, and there's, there's there's a couple like that. You know, the Red Mile, the idea at least, is kind of awesome. But then you kind of you run the Red Mile and it's a bit like, oh, well, that was disappointing. <laughs> um... <laughs> 
Fallout 4 had its problems with things like cut content and there being way too many missions, which is like, go here, kill X amount of stuff. And it was a bit frustrating trying to get the quote-unquote good ending, because you had to do things in like a certain order and, you know, ally with some people for a bit, but then don't go too far with, with being allies and then go and do quests with the other factions to like even things out and it's like you're spinning plates and you wouldn't really know to do that unless you'd played the game once or twice before so i think i ended up like messing up my first playthrough where i locked myself out of being able to do the minute man, uh, man ending and it bugged me but there's no denying that the missions that uh, are there and the spectacle of it all is fantastic that and both you know both that and skyrim as well get off to an amazing start with a nuke going off in the background skyrim's got a dragon coming down it's it really gets you know you hit the hit the ground running as it were whereas this it's a slow burn at the start i mean we're seeing the start here it just like nothing about this screams oh yeah i can't wait to play this game not really I think the best example I can give as to what's wrong with it, just as like a, to round us off here, is let's just look at one mechanic, right? Let's look at making money. I want to make money in the game, okay? I want to make money and I want to level up, right? Okay. I can go and I could level up my bartering skill and then, uh... Well, it's not bash, it's commerce in this, isn't it? But anyway, I could go and level that skill up. I can then come back and get more money for the items I want to sell. Okay. That's perfectly fine. I want to take the stuff that I've got, <clears throat> right, sell it for more, I'll make more money. That's one way of doing it, yeah. Um, but it's not the most efficient way. I want to make loads of money. Okay, well, well, there's a contraband system in the game, so I can go and I can uh, find contraband items, bring them and sell them off to uh, a trade institute uh, place. I don't know, trade institute, trade authority, I think it is, isn't it? But anyway, sell them off to them. They'll take them off my hands. I get a bunch of money. <laughs> Jobs are good and Wow, I've just made a ton of money from doing very little. I mean, so smuggling must be the way to go. And you can find these contraband items usually on pirate ships, right? So board pirate ships, get the, get the contraband, even go and sell the ship afterwards. Except they make it really difficult to actually get through security with contraband. And the whole thing's a dice roll. It's a bit ridiculous. You know, all that, and it's just a dice roll in the end. But then you can save it before getting the dice roll. You know, you've always been able to do that with Bethesda games. You can just save it whenever and just keep rolling it till you eventually get through. So God knows why it's even there as a mechanic. And then you can just go in and sell that and sell the ship. But then you have to register the ship. And that costs money, so you only make about 10% of what the ship's worth, which is usually a couple of grand. Yeah. So it's not worth boarding the ship and selling it, and while you do that, it moves all your inventory items from your ship to that ship, and then back. And it does this whole jiggery-pokery system with the, with the ship cargo, and it's just you, you sat there thinking, what is it doing? Why is it doing that? So, piracy is actually a hassle. And contra and smuggling contraband isn't all that profitable, especially when you go to sell it and it's like, oh, it's worth like 13 grand, I'm going to get a load for this. Then you remember that vendors only give you a fraction of the price that things are worth, so you get like two grand. <laughs> so, oh, right, I forgot. And then once you've got all the uh, once you've got all the money from that, 
and you've gone through all that trouble, you you just think, yeah, this this was not worth doing. And you get more money from just selling some modified guns that you found off the ground on the mission prior to doing that. So then you're probably thinking, okay, so <laughs> that's one thing. Oh, but it gets worse. Even then you think, well, maybe if you just steal things and sell them. No, not not even worth doing. There's barely anything worth stealing in the game. And if you do steal things, not only does it put a bounty on you, and then people just chase after you trying to kill you, um, you can get roped into like a weird quest where you get sent in as an undercover agent into the Crimson Fleet to go and kill the main dude and that. The thing is, this can, the really weird thing is that can trigger if you get any kind of bounty. I don't even remember what I did to trigger it. I just randomly got pulled up by the cops at some point and uh, pulled into this undercover operation thinking, I, I don't even remember what I actually did <laughs> uh, in order to uh, trigger this whole thing. <laughs> I, I straight up could not remember what I had actually done uh, to have that trigger. And I've I've heard that from a lot of people playing it. Like people have been arrested for stealing like cups and things, and then brought into uh, getting at this, you know, doing this whole undercover sting operation. You think there'd be a minimum bounty requirement to get to that point? But no, no, it it can literally be you steal a pencil, you know. <laughs> anyway. But the biggest way to make money in the game <laughs> is, of course, you make an outpost and make the simplest item you can and make a ton of it and then sell it. With me, it were adaptive frames. Easiest way to make money because in the end, shop, uh, all the shopkeepers only have so much money. So there's no point creating like a massive daisy chain where there's loads and loads of different outposts, all uh, shipping loads of different raw materials to one giant manufacturing planet that you've got set up that builds every kind of possible uh, consumable known to man that all then ship it off to a warehouse somewhere and you sell all that to the shop owners. Because no, you eventually have to sell it all to shops who only have like three grand at most on them. So there's no point. You might, and you just make the simplest thing you can. And each one you build, you get one XP. You build them in. I mean, God knows why they put a limit on the maximum amount you're allowed to build. But you can only do 99 at a time, so you end up building like thousands of them, and you just start clicking. But you're getting a kill. You know, you're getting like 10 kills worth of XP each time you click. And you just do that, you get you get completely over encumbered, but you can still move while over encumbered, so there's no point in expanding your ship cargo. <laughs> and just take it all to the uh, to somewhere like Neon and sell it all off, get an absolute ton of cash, and also like 20 levels or something stupid. And when you want more, you just go there, rest for 24 hours at the at the outpost, and do it again. Because all your, uh, all your storage crates will have filled up after about 24 hours. It doesn't take long. Um, really, really weird. Again, that that's just around making money and XP. And that is a fully legit system in the game. You're using in-game mechanics. It's not illegal. It's not an exploit. And it's encouraged. And there's actual skills around it. Not that you actually need any of them. But setting up an outpost, fastest, easiest way to make cash and out-level the rest of the game. You could also then go to a high-level planet, kill a bandit, grab his level 70-something gun, and then go back to the earlier parts of the game, and then just ruffle stomp the entire game. <laughs> That's something you find out you can do later on. You know, you, you can absolutely do that right at the start and nothing would stop you. The fact that all that's in the game is an absolute joke. And again, just every single mechanic is like this. 
Like, the powers you get are stupid. A lot of the uh, mods on guns and on and all the powers that you get uh, through the game are all just mods from Fallout 4 and shouts from Skyrim. And you even called the Starborn. Like, loads of the game is just recycled stuff. <laughs> the amount of loading screens is a joke. I could go on for hours about this. I go on for like 40 minutes at the end of my series that I did on this about how ridiculous the game is. <laughs> I think genuinely Bethesda have screwed up here. We will not see this game saved by mods. There is no way this is saved by mods. Between this and Redfall, Bethesda get the most disappointing this year. They really do. Um, that said, and, and and they do deserve it. They absolutely deserve that. It won't be saved by mods because modders would have to be enthusiastic about actually saving the game and playing the game, and they're not. So they're, they're not enthusiastic about this. They don't care. I don't care. I'm not going to play through it again. It's been a thoroughly mediocre game. Lukewarm at best all the way through. I mean, hell, I'm looking back at this old footage and, oh, it looks like it's... I think I remember this. It was right at the start of the game and we're getting, like, all kinds of frame rate issues and things. <laughs> but, yeah, performance was poor. The game just... It's, it's had all kinds of issues. It really has. <clears throat> Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's it's got critical design flaws that I don't see Bethesda fixing anytime soon, and it would require massive reworks of entire systems within the game. And not just like a little, ooh, just a little bit of this and that will fix it up. Like Fallout 4 will like that. It's like, okay, the settlement system needs sprucing up a bit and... <clears throat> Maybe add a few more guns, a few more outfits. <laughs> uh, see if we can get some of the missing content rammed back in there. Which modders have mostly done for you know, for the most part. There's some really good mods out there for it. Uh, biggest one I would highly recommend is Sim Settlements. Can't recommend that one enough. Absolutely fantastic. Turns the game into like this weird pseudo uh, grand strategy game. Which is absolutely fantastic. Just putting that out there. Really, really fun. Does much, much, uh, does a much, much better job than Fallout's uh, Nuka World DLC did. Which just made no sense. Like, why would you raid your own settlements? It's absolutely bizarre. This just straight up allows you to, if you want, become... Like, you, you basically form your own faction in the waste and just go around claiming everyone else's stuff. For, be it for good or evil. <clears throat> and it's got its own quest line and things now. <clears throat> I don't think we'll see the same level of modding for uh, Starfield. That's if we even get the mod kit at this rate. It looks like it's probably going to be sometime early next year. But we'll see. <laughs> but yeah. Bethesda as a company get most disappointing part of 2023 in the gaming industry. By a country mile. A short little um, little tangent here, just we look at something else as well, just this year. We've had some amazing um, indie games come out this year. They're really doing some different stuff in the scene. Um, one of the games that I have played through, I would have loved to have uh, had some footage ready for this, but I didn't actually film myself playing it. This was one of those that I played way a podcast on in the background and just chilling out in the evenings uh just played through it myself but i played through dredge um absolutely fantastic little game really loved it very interesting and just a different approach to horror where it's just this nice serene environment but then it gets to night time and just weird stuff starts happening you know the lights on the horizon start turning into giant anglerfish that chase you around and there's shapes swirling around in the water and the fish you, you catch start being randomly mutated with tentacles and additional eyes and 
all kinds of stuff like that and you just know that there's something wrong and off-putting about this entire place and sometimes you go to like various things in the world which at day are fine but then you get to night and it's they're completely you know there's like ancient runes glowing on them and stuff like that so really really cool there's, there's also been some other interesting indies dave the diver as one just to mention as it's it's just it does a lot i've, I've watched i've not played it but i've watched a play through dave the diver it's not massively my sort of game but it looks like it does a lot of stuff it doesn't do any one thing particularly brilliantly, but it just throws that much at you. It's like kind of going to an all-you-can-eat buffet of stuff. And that's kind of what David, uh, David Iver is. So, <laughs> and just putting all that stuff into a single game, as weird and wacky as it is, you, know, you, you wouldn't really catch that, uh, catch that outside of the indie scene. <laughs> um... And lastly, just one that's worth mentioning, is the uh, the game Shadows of Doubt. It generates an entire city block. Like, a, a full-on, not like a full city, but there's like a, most of, like a good city block. Like, like a few dozen skyscrapers are generated, full of residents, full of shops and things at the bottoms of them. And they all have jobs, they all do things, they've got a daily routine that they go about. And it kind of simulates this small section of a city. And then you go in, and every so often a crime happens. And you go in as a freelance detective. And you kind of, yeah, you kind of go in and try to... Uh, basically, uh, solve a mystery using your own, uh, well, using your own intuition, piecing things together. But the thing is, it's because those, uh, the people that you're looking into, they exist. They have an apartment. You can go there. There'll be clues. You might find the murder weapon. It's not that, because there's, there's detective games that do a similar thing and probably do it better. But this is doing it on the fly, dynamically, in a procedurally generated city. It's far more interesting. And it's it's just uh, simulating this entire city all while this is going off. Very impressive. Some really cool tech that, while the AAA industry is just chasing after easy wins and battle passes and trends, like you only get this kind of innovation from the indie scene. Because they, they wouldn't even conceive of something like this which is just completely out there and wacky by comparison uh, to what they're doing at the moment <laughs> but yeah just a few small mentions there another one as well not really my kind of thing but very glad to see it come out the finals has uh, released lately uh, going into like i don't know if it's like open beta or if it's finally the full version or whatever it is now you know, final testing where you keep your progress or whatever it is. But just seeing that destruction tech on display on that game. And the, um, yeah, see, seeing like the destruction on display and that it's all server side is very impressive. Um, I remember putting it up on the channel that I really liked the game, but I had issues with just really poor control support and some weird dodgy mishmashed control schemes and that mostly seem to be resolved now and there are console versions out and it is free to play um but having having tried it myself it's it's a bit too and I, I, I guess i'd say sweaty for me yeah you know, i want to have a bit of a chill time on a game not be uh there puffing and panting trying to compete with everyone so not really my thing but <laughs> Yeah, if you're into that sort of thing, if you're really into like competitive first-person shooters, that's available. We'll get into the final throws of the whole thing now. <laughs> but yeah, um, I would say that the highlights of the year, for me personally, I've really enjoyed the remakes that came out. 
I very much enjoyed Resident Evil 4. That's been an absolute blast. Um, and also, though I've not got footage of it, I played it myself alone at night with the sound system on. <laughs> There's, I've also been playing through, uh, I've played through Dead Space as well earlier in the year. Absolutely phenomenal. There have been some really, really good games out this year. And it seems to have been one of the biggest and most bumper years for gaming in possibly a decade or so. It's been an absolutely massive year for games. Um, I would say the big ones that I've played through have been... Uh, what the, what has there been? So there's been Resident Evil 4, very much enjoyed that. Uh, and the Separate Ways DLC that came out. Um... Really enjoyed Dead Space. That was lovingly made, Dead Space. And in addition to those, I've also really found myself enjoying uh, Lords of the Fallen. Though a lot of people don't think it's the greatest game ever, and even I would say, yeah, it had technical hitches and problems like that that would hold it back. The combat wasn't quite there for me. It wasn't bad combat. It was just really, really overly reliant on those lock-on mechanics so a bit of a hit and a miss there with me with loads of form but visually stunning and it genuinely um it did a lot of cool new things for the souls like subgenre but yeah it did some really really impressive things for the souls like subgenre it really did um one of which was, and I kind of forgot to mention this when I was like summing up my thoughts at the end of the game. Like, as much as I dislike the whole lock on heavy combat, one thing that has to be said is that being a mage or being a, using a range build was so much more viable in this. And I would be tempted to do that on a second playthrough or something, but doing that is so much more viable or kind of. You know, dual classing, you know, having a few magic spells, but also being able to um, do a bit of sword and board, or maybe have a ranged, uh, maybe be using like a ranged weapon and uh, using a sword, that sort of thing. Doing all this sort of stuff is way more viable in this. I also really like the block system. So, you know, it's as much as it does have its shortcomings in certain ways it more than makes up elsewhere i would say it's absolutely worth your time uh, if you can get it on a sale i'd see no reason to avoid it it's just just buy it if you like souls likes it's a no-brainer if it's on sale what are you waiting for um if you can of course that's if you can run this like i would definitely be ready to pull the trigger on that steam refund it has had some performance issues i've had specifically a lot of performance issues with it it seems to have issues around amd cards especially so it technical hiccups and a few design uh, a few bits of design here and there that have held it back but all that said even with all that it does a lot of things right and nothing's going to take away from the stunning visuals of this game. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, but all that said, <laughs> I think it's definitely up there with my games of the year this year. It's the one, uh, the others that I would mention, I've just recently actually been playing it over my. Uh, Christmas break. I've managed to finish Spider-Man 2. I've still got Alan Wake on the uh, on the list to finish up before I get back to get back to work. But definitely Spider-Man 2's been absolutely excellent. A really good, uh, really good sequel. Some really cool visuals and awesome stuff that happens. There's like whole city-wide transformations at various points in the game. That are absolutely stunning. But I think this, as much as you're probably expecting our game at year, then it's going to be. Eh, well, we, we have to mention it. The elephant in the room here, of course, is Baldur's Gate 3. 
I typically don't play those types of games, not because I dislike them, but it's just trying to find like 150 hours to fit that in is a little bit difficult. Especially when you don't have like a D&D group or, some, or something that you can play with uh, as you go through it, so it'd just be me. And for that reason, I found myself not buying it. I think I've still got to get through Divinity Original Sin 2 at some point. So... <laughs> But it really is like, from what I've seen, it's the culmination of everything they did with the Divinity Original Sin that they then refined with the, with Divinity uh, Original Sin 2. And then Baldur's Gate 3 is that, but they've cranked everything up to 11. And it creates this, because it's things like, okay, now all the characters are voice acted and there's cutscenes for them and... It's just way better. The choices are more impactful. There's way more ways that they've kind of... Because they kind of try and take into account stuff going wrong in the game. Or you just offing an NPC. And the game tries to kind of... Because it's a weird bit of game design where they kind of... They allow you to literally just lop sections of the game off. And allow the game to just hobble on. Which is a weird design philosophy, but you end up with these weird and wacky playthroughs that you see from people at this point. Um, and yeah, that that that's kind of what you get with Baldur's Gate 3, and it it's very impressive that it can do that. You know, it's like oh, you've killed all the friendly NPCs, but I guess we'll just roll with it. Kind of very much in the spirit of a frustrated uh, DM, but uh, yeah. It's probably the most authentic D&D experience that you can get. I can 100% see why people have been putting this as Game of the Year. But I didn't play it. So it's not my Game of the Year. <laughs> so for me, as you can probably guess on the footage, it's and I'm, I'm going to give it to two. Because, you know, it's hey, it's, it's my year roundup. I can do what I like. I'm going to get this and I'm going to get to a Dead Space, honestly. This, people don't think is as brilliant as some other games, but I had like nearly 80 hours worth of absolute fun. Just all like 80 hours of bliss with this. Really fun. Very much worth it. You know, I think when you get to a point where it's really high quality entertainment and you're paying like 50p an hour, you know, it's... I mean, it's daft enough when you're getting it for like a quid an hour. That's, I think that's pretty, a pretty good bargain. But I think, yeah, I did get probably about 50p an hour worth out of Lords at Fallen. Ridiculously good fun for cost at thing. And again, just visually stunning. It's been one of, it's been one of the few games that have actually pushed my system since I upgraded it. And I think that's partly due to just bad optimization, but. Have, you know, just having the joy of actually playing something that really re is just really, really visually striking. And we're going to see more of this with upcoming games. There's a lot more coming out on the new Unreal Engine. So it's going to be, it's going to be fun watching all that unfold. And then there's Dead Space. And exactly the same, except Dead Space, it's like absolute nostalgia bait for me. Um, my favourite horror games would be Dead Space and Alien Isolation, and it would be a genuine toss-up between the two. But I think now it's probably the Dead Space remake. Just and little things that they did with the system, like there's a system now that makes it so that it's like a tension system. So if nothing happens for a little while, it'll make something happen. Like, for example, the lights flicker. You know, it spawns an enemy. Uh, stuff like that and little things like that happening through the game really you know it really keep things feeling you know tense you've got lights going off and flickering it's way darker as well and you've got to keep your you've got to aim to get your flashlight out which means of course the camera zooms in so the necromorphs can appear behind you without you even seeing it's it does some brilliant things I've always thought that horror should be first person because it's it's more immersive and horror is all about immersion. Like, on, honestly, 
if role playing games are all about like character customization um i think horror games are absolutely 110 percent all about immersiveness like the game can be hot garbage as long as it immerses you it'll be a good horror game typically um <laughs> but yeah all that said those are going to be my games of the year of this uh other mentions that i've put out there as, as well there but for me in particular this year that's why i would say the real the real winners of it all so as a last aside just looking forward to next year and years to come and a few predictions on what we've got i mean there's some already fantastic looking games um straight away almost next year i think this is like mid-february there's going to be a game i've been looking forward to called pacific drive where you literally like chase ghosts and weird alien anomaly things think like stalker but with a car that you build it's like one of those weird janky mechanic simulator games crossed with the stalker series and it's all in like a roguelike sense so it looks absolutely crazy bizarre and what you can do with that um and it's not just like the only weird and wacky game coming out next year like there's some really cool stuff uh we're getting a new hell divers game i love hell divers you know definitely getting the squad back together going on that get me brother on that sort of thing probably see a bit of it on the channel i'd be surprised if you didn't and it's third person and in the unreal engine now and that's another thing with the unreal engine really starting to come into prominence now because and i do think that lords of the fallen was perhaps like the unwitting first beta tester of the unreal engine it was like the first major release using it so i think that's why it had a lot of performance issues i don't think it was necessarily their fault i think they're still working out the kinks but as more games come out on that we're going to see a lot more indie games capable of going toe to toe with the uh, uh, with the big developers and you're just going to see this more and more as the tools become better and more widely available that's just going to keep happening <laughs> but yeah there looks to be some absolutely great stuff set to come out with this being one of them but more than that i'm also really really looking forward in addition to this to um well, so, so yeah, there's stuff like Hell Divers, there's stuff like, there's Dragon Dog, Dragon's Dogma 2 coming out. I've been watching the first one, it looks alright, but very ropey and janky, like, they're trying to do, a, they're obviously trying to do a lot with very little, to the point where it kind of breaks a bit as a game. So yeah, that's a thing. So seeing them with a big budget and more staff and resource and things seeing what they can do with that and create what is basically dark souls monster hunter looks great but of course you know it's one thing to look forward to that sort of thing and there are other great games i mean oh man i saw the space marine 2 trailers and the gameplay footage they released it looks absolutely sublime genuinely disappointed it's been held back again but I'd much rather have a working and functional game than a uh, broken mess. So hopefully they get it sorted and it just gets released when it's fully ready. Um, but all that said, though, going on to the subject of yeah predictions, I think we're going to see a slow waning away from these battle passes and live services. A lot of them have started failing. And... <laughs> I think it's just a case of people don't have that much time. They require a lot of time from you. You purchase the right to unlock things in the game, which is bizarre when you think about it. If you'd have taken that idea, you know that that idea, that premise back about ten years ago, you'd have been laughed at. People would think you were mad. You you pay not to get stuff, but to have the right to unlock things in the game, and only for so long as well. A lot of these battle passes are time sensitive, so 
<laughs> when you think about it, it's a really dumb idea, and it's like, yeah, that that isn't going to hold up long term, especially when they all start competing for the same amount of time that you have. So, yeah, I don't see that holding out long. In addition, I think that we're going to see, as as well as a waning off from these battle passes and other various trends and that, the industry seems to be kind of receding back a bit. We've seen a lot of layoffs this year. There's been tons and tons of layoffs. I think it's the case of, and I was talking about this with my brother and that, and read a few articles on it. It seems to be that everyone's kind of hit um, the COVID years. And it's, it's a shame because you, you're actually encouraged to do this on a business level and by the government. You get massive tax penalties if you just hoard wealth. So if you, for example, in the UK, if you make more than about 40 grand a year, you start paying 40% tax. So up to that uh, 40 grand, you're only paying like a little bit in tax. Tiny amount. But beyond that, now, it's only the money after that first 40 grand. But say you make uh, 60k, well, you've made 20,000 above, uh, above that 40 grand. So that, 20, that 20k... You'll only get eight. Yeah. Less than half. In fact, sorry, I've, I think I mixed that up. So, no, you'll get 12. So, so you, you'll lose eight. You'll lose eight. You pay 40% of it in tax. You'll lose eight. So you, you lose nearly half. So what, what they typically do, because it gets even worse if you, as you reach the higher thresholds. So as a business, they'll just write it off as a business expense by investing it into the company it's like okay rather than have um all this money coming to me and then i have to pay masses of tax i'll pour it into the business and the business will then make more money in the future and then whenever i need more money the business is just constantly pumping out cash then and i can kind of do whatever i want <laughs> So long as the business stays float, but I won't hoard any of that money because I'd have to pay a tax. And it, it's it's kind of that. So you end up with people reinvesting things. So everyone's had a massive bumpy couple of years due to COVID, captive audience and all that. They've all expanded their business. And it's all swollen out of control because they made tons of money during COVID. And then COVID's over and all the numbers have gone back down. And we're, I think that's what we're seeing here. Um, that said, though, I think as we move into the future, it will probably become more commonplace, though, because I think we will start to see. And kind of the reason I'm showing Starfield footage here, big long-term prediction here, I genuinely think that the future of gaming is going to be less and less with AAA games. As indies are starting to be able to make really cool stuff quickly with the Unreal Engine now. And they're even giving out like versions of it to kids basically in Fortnite in the form of like map edits and things where they can mess around with stuff. And they can get way more in depth with it uh, at this point. It won't be long until we're basically moving away from massive mega developers. There'll still be a need for them. People will still be there wanting to uh, <laughs> wanting to do uh, giant big budget titles. They'll always still be able to produce things that are way larger, way more impressive than any single uh, individual will be able to. Just due to the scale of production and that, you know. But we're going to be able to see small independents do a lot more with what little they've got. So I think there's going to be a move toward that. And I think it's going to be more so as we move toward AI. We're already getting generative stuff. We're barely using it in industry at the moment, but we're beginning to. The next few years, that'll get more prominent. You know, it wasn't that long ago that, hey, ray tracing is the hot new thing. 
now it's getting put into most, if not all, games that are coming out. Pretty much. <laughs> so we look at Starfield here with its outdated design and things. And you have to remember that the next game that's coming out for them is uh, Elder Scrolls 6. Like, they have to beat their own game. Just putting it out there. Right? Elder Scrolls 6, its main primary competition will be Skyrim. Not anything else, not Baldur's Gate, not, you know, nothing like that. And Baldur's Gate is really like, it's, it's almost like holding up a mirror to Bethesda. Because you look at Baldur's Gate, it's like, right, in the same time, it's gone from Skyrim to Fallout 4, Fallout 76, and then Starfield, Baldur's Gate, in actually less time, in less time, because I looked up the release dates before this, but in less time, uh, La Larian Studios have <laughs> completed their Kickstarter, released Divinity Original Sin, then the sequel, and then made Baldur's Gate 3 in less time than it's taken uh, Bethesda to make Starfield and Fallout 4 after Skyrim, right? That, you know, you let that sink in for a moment, and yeah, it is, it is harrowing. Just what? Like, like you, you just think, what have you been doing in that time? Um. Meanwhile, you can look at Skyrim these days, and some of the mod lists and some of the mods that are coming out for it are absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> they really absolutely are. And it's really, like, a really dumb thing is just before... Um, just before the uh, holidays, Bethesda have released a massive patch for Skyrim that does nothing but add a bunch, I think it's like six new paid mods uh, into the game, but it's broken all the other mods. So ju that, that's just how, you've got to remember, that's how Bethesda treat their fans. Just before Christmas, everyone's like, ooh, we've played Starfield, you know what, that's made us really want to play Skyrim, you can look the numbers up on that on Steam as well, the Steam charts, it's like, yeah, loads of people have taken Skyrim up again after, you know, a couple months after Starfield. But, just as that's happening, they release an update that adds paid crap to the game that no one really wanted, but breaks all the other mods that they've been using. Yeah. Right before Christmas. Just in case you wanted to play any other holidays. Screw you. Screw. You know, just absolutely screw the modders. Screw you guys. Screw everyone. That's what Bethesda think. And they're wondering why uh, Starfield's got mostly, ne uh, mostly negative reviews now. Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't surprise anyone. I think that not only are we going to see more AI tools come out. Not only are we going to see more... Um, what's it, smaller developers doing way more and punching way above their weight, <laughs> Um, I think that it will get crazier and crazier in the coming years, to the point where I genuinely think that even though Elder Scrolls will be running on an engine designed specifically for it, like, we all joke about how the uh, creation engine is a joke and Bethesda should have replaced it eons ago. <laughs> it's as much as a running of a running joke as it is. You've got to remember <laughs> that it was specifically made to create Elder Scrolls games. It's struggling with Starfield just as it struggled with Fallout 3. Maybe given time and when they eventually get all the systems properly in place and uh, get everything down, maybe it would be good for releasing Starfield, but for an Elder Scrolls game, everything's in place and ready to go. In fact, just based on what they've got on Starfield and Fallout, you know, hell, there should at least be like a settlement building system available on the next Elder Scrolls. You know, build your own, uh, build your own hold and all that like, probably. Could probably do something like that. At least your own house, I'd, 
uh, I'd assume. But <laughs> I could definitely, I could definitely see Elder Scrolls, the next one, actually possibly being quite good. But looking at this and the design, I think I would put my money on it being an absolute god awful mess. I think it will be an absolute mess. The likes of which we have never seen before and will never see again. In the meantime, this same year, we have seen on about AI and that, we've seen Skyrim get AI companions added. As in they use like a AI chat plugin to like chat GPT. And it goes through like a voice synthesizer so they can dynamically reply to you. Like that, that that's a mod for Skyrim now. Absolutely incredible. And the the biggest set of like the biggest games that will benefit from the eventual inclusion of AI tools and things will be games that have masses of content where it just requires, you know, loads of voices and quests and dialogue. There's just lots and lots of busy work that you have to do to put the thing together. Open world games are probably going to be some of the biggest games to benefit, specifically RPGs, which means an Elder Scrolls game, if it were to utilise this stuff, not that they could hope to even get this kind of tech in the create, uh, creation engine. There's no way this gets added in for the next game. Meanwhile, as a Skyrim mod, maybe. Maybe it will. But the thought of having NPCs that can like dynamically react and speak back to you and remember and uh, interact, you know, remember things and interact with you in that kind of way, that's absolute lunacy to me. That That's something from like sci fi. And we're nearly at that point. But you think that's probably, like I said, that's probably just the start. It wouldn't surprise me if soon you're able to maybe like scan an object with a phone, you know, do like a panorama view photo and then it convert it to a 3D object and do all the textures for you, you know. It might even be able to like dynamically rig and animate characters soon enough for you. When you're able to do these sorts of things with like third party tools and stuff, the mods are going to get absolutely ridiculous. Especially like all the voice synth stuff. Like we've seen some really nutty things like uh, Trump and Joe Biden playing Call of Duty with like deep fake voice synthesizers this year. You know, the mods you could make with this are absolutely nuts. And I think that's probably what we're going to see. We're going to see in a few years, you know, predict. So predictions are this stuff's going to go off the rails. We're going to get a load of cool games for 2023. Unreal Engine 5 is going to become more prominent and over the years we're going to see a massive influx of more AI tools and modders are going to really start to roll up their sleeves and pull more than their weight with these new tools. <laughs> Elder Scrolls 6 will release and it will be outcompeted by Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim because I reckon by then Skyrim will have been completely <laughs> reworked from the ground up most likely by the modders uh, with how insane the amount of stuff they'll be able to do will get and i think it will get to a point where literally you'll be able to just go in and have conversations with all the characters in the game like dynamic conversations and using like a chat gpt plugin going through a voice synthesizer they'll respond back to you and you'll just download a bunch of voice packs for the voice synthesizer and everyone in the game will have their own voice because they'll just train the AI on the current voice lines. So they'll all have the voices of the original voice actors synthesized, responding to you. <laughs> and that's before we even get into the visuals and things. <laughs> and all the graphical enhancements they'll probably be able to pull. But yeah, for those of you who have not been keeping your ear to the ground on this, this is what Skyrim looks like nowadays. <laughs> With like a billion mods and a massive graphics card. This is like just one of the people I've been looking at. I think they're called Mouse on YouTube. Literally Mouse as you would expect it to be spelt. Uh, and just type Skyrim after name. You'll probably get it. Um, there's a bunch of videos. They're trying to make like a mod pack. But there's some incredible stuff out there. 
there's other stuff as well some come with their own installers and that's another thing like one click installs as well now um i saw a video the other day of someone making like a, um, a massive map for valheim and some of the stuff that modders are able to do now not just in games like skyrim but in everything else absolutely incredible and i think we're genuinely gonna see like when all these because i think the ai genie is out of the bottle at least in terms of like creating procedural you know what's it procedurally generated content now you know image video and uh what's it uh even getting to the point of 3d object generation is just becoming a bit of an you know something easy to do now <clears throat> you know that it's more or less down we're going to at least see that there's some brilliant tools on photoshop that are ai enhanced now which is incredible but as these come to the f uh, come more to the fore we're going to see way crazy stuff that this is just the start so the future of gaming is looking absolutely not just great but it's it's been more than safe hands and more people will be empowered further to make better games and it will get to a point i think where if you want to make a game you'll just fire up an engine get like a ai assistant to help you do some code and that generate a few things and you'll be away i think we'll even get to a point i mean there's there have been some very recently just before christmas there have been some big developments in ai video generation it wouldn't surprise me soon if you can just storyboard out um a cutscene that you want to happen and you could probably do that storyboard with ai image generation as well if you're a bad artist and then it could probably animate the storyboard into a film that will probably i reckon within the next six months i think we'll probably be at that point if not the year but definitely soon with the we're kind of i'm not gonna go all overboard and say oh wow we're gonna have terminators soon and we'll be rising against the machines and there's gonna be all kinds of crazy ai stuff but i think at the very least we can say there's gonna be some excellent mods as well as some excellent memes come out for gaming it looks like the future is very bright and i think it's important to remember all this and look to the future with all because oftentimes you know with the, with the crap games of the year list and the disappointing stuff that's happened this year and some of the really scummy things that have happened with battle passes and cancelled and cut content and uh, support for games just just dissolving <laughs> basically as much as all that's going off there's some really absolute massive gems out there and it's just part and parcel of the industry as the industry gets bigger there'll be some bigger and better games released like the the, the highs will be higher and there'll be more of them but it'll be the same with the lows you know and that's just what we're gonna have to face anyway i think that's pretty much everything i wanted to say so thank you very much for watching and listening to me rant about games for the year very much looking forward to the next year and i've of course i've even gone through all this i've not even mentioned that you know path of exile 2 is coming out uh, next year that's going to be absolutely excellent already just partly into the year there's a bunch of things slated but we're looking for another good year so i hope to see you for that on the channel but for 2023, this has been me. I'll see you next year. Well, I'll be putting this up on the very first of 2024. So, Happy New Year, if you're seeing it on the day. I'll see you next time.